Well, we've got an awesome guest. Aubrey's with us. Aubrey, you're from what, Portland area. Tell us where you're at right now. Uh, I live in unincorporated Washington County, which is um, just outside of Portland. I'm in the burbs, but I'm here via New York City, which is where I'm from originally. That's awesome. So what took you to Portland? Many, many years ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I came to college here. I actually went to college in Washington State. And I tell you how long ago that was, but then that would give away my age. So um, my husband is from here. And we lived here for about three years when we first got married. And then we moved back east for about 13 years. And so I've just been back in, in Portland Metro um, about three years. We, we moved back, honestly, primarily to be closer to my husband's family, but also because I, uh, my oldest son through adoption is from India. And uh, where we were living in Maine, there wasn't much of an Indian population. So we decided to move back to the Portland area where we thought that he would feel more uh, comfortable in the community out here. So that's why that kind of what drove us back out. And when you were in the New York area, were you guys, were you selling real estate back in that neck of the woods or? No, I, um, I actually was in education just out of uh, college. I was in uh, college admissions. I was a high school teacher. And um, then we opened up pet supply stores focusing in holistic nutrition and homeopathy and supplements. Um, and so I really only started real estate. I got licensed in July of 2017. So just about coming up on three years now. So had not sold houses, but I really could tell you anything you wanted to know about the texture of cat litter. <laughs> so what got you interested in real estate now that you've moved to the Portland area? Um, I'll tell you the PC version and then I'm gonna tell you the real one. The PC version was that um, my, my family has always uh, moved around a lot and was interested in flips. My dad is a historian. You know, certainly the East Coast is great for um, kind of architecture and history and that is all totally true and legit. The real reason is because my husband said, you know, there's just no margin in pet food. Like there just isn't, it's like 30% and you like kill yourself all day, every day. Um, and why don't you actually do something that you love to do where you actually make some money? And so that's what I did. I got licensed, I was with another brokerage, um, a small kind of regional brokerage out here and joined Keller Williams um, just about almost two years ago. Okay. So how long have you been licensed for? So July of 2017. So, so almost three years. Coming up on three years. Yeah. Well, well great job, by the way. Thanks, Jake. Jake and was my old coach, by the way. Last that's year. where we know each other. That's so we'll, we know we'll, each other. we'll get into that story. It's okay. a fun story. Now yeah. tell us about your family world, because that's, that's what a lot of folks here are interested in knowing more about is, is what's your family life? What's that look like? And then what we'll get into is your business, how it's structured and how you balance all this stuff together. So tell us about your family life. Um, well, my husband and I have been married almost 20 years and we have three kiddos. Um, I have my oldest child is, oh gosh, he's almost 14. And then I have a 10 year old and I have a six year old as well. Um, yeah, uh, my oldest is special needs, so that's a whole other can of tomatoes. Um, I also have been uh, very involved with March of Dimes. Um, I worked on as their fundraising chair um, on staff for about three years. Um, I, we had a son who passed away at birth, who was our first child. And so we have definitely devoted a lot of sort of family time to fundraising um, for babies that were born prematurely in his memory. So that's sort of my my personal life. Um, we have a 14 year old dog named Buddha. He sleeps a lot, so he doesn't require a ton of attention, but um, yeah, I'm busy just like everybody else, right? Gymnastics, ballet, swimming, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, not right the second, obviously, but in general, there's a lot going on. Give us the status of, of what's going on in Portland. I mean, here in Colorado, um, we kind of almost have sort of freedom is the way I'll, I'll, I'll describe it. You know, I mean, we, we have to be covered up, masked up, sprayed up, washed up, the <laughs> whole nine yards. I mean, you name it, it's got to happen before we walk in or walk out. However, we do have that ability and now we're starting to see listings going, 
I mean, I think we had over 2,000 listings hit the market, over 2,000 go under contract last week. What's going on in Portland? Same, really. Um, you know, Seattle was sort of the epicenter when this all started, and they shut it down uh, pretty quickly afterwards. And Portland and California tend to follow Washington's lead. Um, so we are uh, in essential service. We've been in essential service uh, from day one, thank goodness. And um, you know, I'm personally I'm staying home a lot because I, I do have you know young kiddos, um, but I'm still absolutely um, doing a lot of business. Um, they just started today actually as phase one to try to see how Portland Metro is going to do, and not really Portland Metro, but actually Oregon as a whole will do with um, businesses starting to come open. So um, I actually suspect here in my county, which is one of the more populated counties that we're actually, uh, we're at least a few weeks behind of that phase one because they were the most populated counties were not able to be open, you know, at this point. But, you know, we're, um, you know, we're, we're doing business, we're doing showings, I'm doing Zoom listing, it's weird. I do my cl I do these home buyer classes, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. But um, you know, I'm, I'm we're we're doing those classes. We're doing state of the market classes. Like we're still doing business. It's just it's just different. Very not good. not not worse though. Maybe something we always should have been doing to begin with, to be honest. But especially washing the hands. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it interesting, right? I mean, call it what it is, washing hands. However, when you look at the business piece and, and how it's coming together and how it's translating into our world today, it, to be able to sit back and go, man, these are some efficiencies that if we can continue to carry forward, we can care for a lot more people at a higher level than what we were doing in the past. Um, no doubt. And that is really shown up in these home buyer classes because I used to have, you know, between 15 and 30 people sitting in seats in person for these home buyer classes, which I'd really love to kind of uh, expand on that in a little while. But um, what I was realizing is I should have been doing an online version of this the whole time because instead of 30 people, you can have 100 people on a Zoom call and maybe your attention isn't quite the same, but your net is so much wider and your, your, um, your, your branding is so much larger this way. So um, when we do go back to whatever normal is, we absolutely are going to continue to do in-person classes when we can do that again, but we absolutely are going to add this online component um, because there are things that we should have been done doing differently. I think the whole time and um, you know um, you know uh, it's, it's, what is it? The necessity is the mother of invention, right? That's exactly it. So, so tell us about your business. You started three years ago or almost three years ago at first year in the business. How'd you do? So I was at another brokerage um, and I did 13 um, and I didn't really have anything to base that on, on whether that was good, bad or indifferent, but um, I liked the brokerage I was in. Um, they were very nice. It was kind of a, an old school brokerage. They did not have a lot of technology. There was not a lot of collaboration, um, but they were certainly very nice and ethical and I enjoyed being there. And then um, I was recruited by a friend who was just a, a school mom friend um, at Keller Williams, and they asked me to go to um, Mega Camp and as a guest. I think they're right. And um, that that was an experience because I was a little. Um, I felt at the at the former brokerage like I. I knew I could do a lot more, but I wasn't sure how. And I didn't know what I didn't know. I knew that I was getting a little antsy, but I knew that if I wanted to bring my business to the next level, that I had absolutely no idea how to do that. So when I went to Mega Camp, for any of you who have been to Mega Camp or Family Reunion, it was like, I just, I sat in that huge um, theater in Austin and just with my eyes just wide and I couldn't speak because I just, it was so much of what I was looking for as far as um, just culture and education and, and all the things that are really important to me, you know, talking about, you know, God, family and business. I mean, listening to Mo, I mean, it was, I was, my head was completely blown. So uh, when I got back um, to uh, Portland within two and a half weeks, I had transitioned over to Keller Williams. Um, and I actually started, much to my TL chagrin, 
on a team because like a lot of other people, especially coming into Keller Williams, um, there's a lot to learn. There's a really steep learning curve. I didn't understand any of the acronyms at all. Probably still don't. <laughs> I'm ALC culture chair and I still have no idea what half these things mean, but um, I wanted to join a team because I thought that that would give me sort of a foundation. Um, and my TL, Leslie Hilbert at the time, who's fantastic, and she was like, you know, I gotta tell you, like, you've done um, your, your KPA, you know, your DISC, like, I've met with you several times, like, that lady, like, there is nothing about your personality that says you should be on a team, like, but um, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned Leslie's always right. Um, and I realized that I just, um, I am, I'm better doing things on my own, um, just in my own processes and for my own learning. So um, I was on that team last year. So what, that was 20, whatever that was. My second year, my second full year, I did 46. So I went from 13 to 46. Mm -hmm. And this year I'm on track to do 70 and I'm a solo agent. I'm a solo agent and one woman is not an Island. So it's not like I do everything because one thing I learned from KW is leverage it out, right? Like focus on your 20% leverage out the other 80%. So um, I have a transaction coordinator who is in house. Uh, she works for several different people in, Kel in Keller Williams at my market center um, on her team. She has a listing coordinator who helps to um, do, you know, coordinate signing or um, signs and cleaning and staging and, you know, measurements and all that stuff. Um, I have a virtual assistant um, because my full-time assistant actually quit the day of that we started quarantine. So that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Always a growing exercise. Woo! Yeah. Well, thank goodness I took, um, that class in, uh, in hiring, because that was interesting. Um, and um, so anyway, I have a virtual assistant who's been helping me kind of fill in the blanks. And um, that's basically it. It's, it's my TC listing coordinator. And then I have an assistant who helps me kind of just get stuff into command and deal with my, um, uh, you know, my newsletters and uh, the smart plans and all that good stuff. So can I back up for a second, if you're willing, and it's totally up to you. You and I had a very honest and raw conversation in front of an entire bold classroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are you okay to tell that story? Mm -hmm. So, so tell, cause, cause I don't think you're alone in that conversation. And, and I think that's part of why we have the, the group today here. And what they're interested in knowing is what happened and how did you take the step? Right? Cause, cause there's that fear, there's that moment. And that conversation in that bold room had a lot to do with if I do this and go explode my business the way I know I can, I'm not going to be able to be the great mom that I want to be. Right. So there, I, I would say, like, honestly, it's not even a paid endorsement from Jake, is that bold, absolutely, every time I take it, changes my business in a way that I don't expect in, in a way that's usually uncomfortable, but is profound. Uh, personally, as well as professionally. The first time I took bold, I realized what was holding my, me back was that I was really trying, and Jake knows this, that I was really trying to fit in. Um, Northwest, I've been to Colorado, it's kind of a similar vibe. Everybody's like super chill and super, everything's great and groovy and all of that, but I've got very high energy. I'm from New York and I'm a little, I'm a little saucy. I don't do things, I'm not like what I would consider super polished, you know, and I really tried my first year to like, to fit in and, and I just was not doing a good job at it, frankly, like I was just spinning wheels and my energy um, was really spent in trying to figure out how to attract people that would like me in that way. And then I just, in my first bold, I just said to heck with it. Like, you know, your vibe attracts your tribe. I'm a high energy person. And, you know, if that doesn't work for you, I mean, I do mirror and match. I really believe in that. But I also believe that you attract the people that when you're vulnerable, uh, when you're really open and honest. So I just kind of let it go. And it was hard and it was scary, but I was like, well, this is me. So that was bold number one. Um, when I met with Jake, 
my big thing there was I felt like I was missing my kids growing up. And I think the big pivotal moment there was, I mean, I was working like seven days a week and Kelly Henderson, my maps coach basically told me like, you can't, you can't do that anymore. Like, you know, you're going to burn out and you're, and you're, you're really unhappy. So you have to block that time out in your schedule, not just for that one day off, but like multiple actual like vacations and other things. Um, but with Jake, the pivotal moment really was that I was working, I was showing houses or something. And, um, and my daughter was at gymnastics. She was probably four at the time. Um, she is very small for her age and is very, um, that gives her a lot of sort of uh, nervousness. But she did something huge in gymnastics, which is that she made it up to the very, very top, top, top of the rope. I mean, this is a super tall ceiling and it like gives me anxiety to think about it now, but um, this was a big deal. Nobody else in her class had done it. And it was the first time that she had done it. And my husband was there and I wasn't, and I missed it. And it was, it's a small thing, but I, it devastated me because I realized like, and I mean, to be honest, even now, this time in quarantine, this is the most amount of time I've ever spent with my children. And that shouldn't be, right? Like that shouldn't be. I don't wanna miss their childhood because I'm so busy trying to fund their college educations or trips or whatever else it is that I'm doing. Like none of that stuff actually means anything if they don't know their mother. And, you know, I spent, because of we lost our first child, I have very, very high risk pregnancies. So with my second and third kids, biological children, I was on bed rest with them for like eight months each, like didn't leave the bed, bed rest. So like I worked hard to get them here, <laughs> lots of surgeries and medical appointments and all this stuff, right? And so the fact that I wasn't there to be with my kids was just, it killed me. And I knew that Jake could understand where I was coming from because I know he's got a gaggle of kids as well. Um, and it was through that bowl that I realized you know, I might like showing houses and I do, but not enough to like miss my kid's soccer practice. So what I did was one of the first hires I did, of course, was a transaction coordinator slash listing. But my second one, um, and because in Oregon, you sort of have to be a principal broker in order to have a team. So I found an excellent, excellent uh, solo agent in my market center whose business uh, was, you know, just starting. Frankly, he's better at showing houses than I ever was anyway. And what I decided to do is ask him if he would be willing to have his own business, but also be my showing assistant. And I split, um, I give him some of the commission from each sale for it. And then he'll also sit inspections or he'll do walkthroughs. And so that piece alone, my business is really about 65 percent buyer and 35 percent listing. You got to figure buyers take up a lot of time. So he is really taking on the burden of that. And for that 15% that I'm giving him, it's well worth it to me to free up that time. And that's really how I changed my business and was able to go from really from 46. And let's see, we started, what are we in May? I'm at 33 right now. So I'm going to hit 70 by December, by, by the end of the year. Um, I've got 11 in transaction right now. And I have, um, three new listings coming up next week and two active listings that just went up this week. I'm going to hit it. But the way that I hit it was that I had to let go of some of the control because it was the only way I was going to like see my family was to like, the only way to really grow your business is to take that leap and let other people do the stuff that they're good at so that I can focus on the stuff that I'm good at, which is lead generation. Oh, look, Bud just said, what are your main legs of lead generation? That's it, right there. And that was going to be the next question. So what does your typical day look like? And where, do your, where does your business come from? I mean, to, to be an individual agent and get to 70 transactions, how? Yeah. Well, so I have a class that I teach. I actually um, started teaching it after this session of Bold Pivot about building a business with no sphere. I moved back to Portland and I didn't know anybody here. So that was really interesting and in trying to figure out sort of where that was going to come from. So initially the lead stuff came from, of course, where it usually does, which is open houses when you're a new agent. So I think I did something like 18 open houses my first month. Like it was just, I was just crazy. Um, 
that's where it started. And I would do mega open houses. So um, they were all themed. We had, you know, I always had music and I would do social media posts and door knocking and the whole nine yards. So that was really my first leg of lead generation. I actually um, transitioned from open houses long before this whole quarantine thing started. Because what I realized is that there were better, more effective uses of my time. So legs of lead generation now are, are three, um, and they're, I would say, sort of equal. Um, one is networking. I love networking. I formed a BNI chapter, uh, which is Business Networking International, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and it always consists of your four core. So the four startup people are real estate, lending, financial, um, and PNC right? So property and casualty insurance. And then from there, um, you just kind of grow. So that has been huge for me because I'm sort of a natural connector of people. And I always have been in real estate. My gosh, we're all sort of like that anyway, but that's sort of my, that's sort of my jam. So, so um, go ahead. Oh, keep on. So that's your first oh. one. Yes, was networking. And then I also belong to several social media groups. Um, and one of them, they're all like local groups. One of them is for specifically for women in business. Uh, another one is just kind of community social media. And um, that has given me, and these are in, in, initially these were meetups, right, in person. And now it's, you know, via Zoom or whatever it is. Um, but the reason I, I, I talk about the networking piece, you know, people do business with people that they like, but also I am constantly in, even in my listings, so like in my listings, I will have a little placard that says like deep cleaning done by Leanne Tristan at Unique to You Cleaning, you know, windows cleaned by KJM Window Cleaning. Like I am constantly in my business in every part of my business on social media. I am tagging my networking partners on a regular basis because there is literally no part of my business that is not represented by networking, whether it's my client gifts or um, my lender, my, um, my contractors, every, literally everybody are people that I network with. And I, I wanted to show you something. I don't know if you can see it on your screen. Can you see that? Yep. Welcome home. This is my welcome home book. And this is, um, on one side of here, these are just address labels. This is all stuff from escrow, but here I have four categories for the welcome home book, residential services, professional services, um, health and wellness and, um, and food and drink, and then tons of like flyers and coupons. These are my networking people in this book. This is like 12 pages of people that I give this to every client that I serve, sellers and buyers. Um, one of the best things I ever did, and this was early on, is, and this kind of goes back to networking, but this is really my second leg of lead generation, which is referral. So one of the best things I did was B2B, business to business. And I found people that had businesses that were complementary to real estate or just in the community. And I brought them into my office for coffee or tea. And it wasn't about me. It's talking about, tell me about your business. Tell me everything as if, so that if someone asks me what you do, I can, I can represent you as well as you represent you. And after that, they became a referral partner. So that's how this book developed through networking and then referrals. Um, and my third leg of lead generation, and this was really interesting, <laughs> is my home buyers class. The home buyers class was a necessity because I was getting so many questions about buying houses because of the social media presence that I have in my social media groups. And because I'm posting constantly and tagging my referral partners that my name became sort of a buzz in the community. And I had to do these classes because frankly, like I couldn't meet with 30 people in a week. So about 13 months ago, we started this class and of course in person at the time and at there once a month, um, they were Saturdays from 11 to one and we are the fab five. 
So it's me. Uh, I have a fantastic lender partner. Um, I have a home warranty gal. I have a homeowner's insurance, you know, property and casualty and uh, escrow title. I don't know if you have, do you guys have escrow down? Is it escrow title down there? Not lawyers? No, yeah, it's escrow and title. Same. Yeah, so um, we have a two hour class and um, I take about 45 minutes of it. And what I'm talking about is the home buying process, but my, my claim to fame, I think, for me and the thing that I enjoy doing is um, data. I'm very, very heavily deep in micro markets, um, in the market overviews. I listen to Lawrence Young at NAR a lot. Um, I follow the Federal Reserve. Like I'm really interested in that piece of it. And so when someone is asking me what's going on in like Hillsborough, which is a neighboring community, I know what the list of sales price ratio is. I know the average days on market. I can tell you, um, how many went active and then how many went pending in the same week. I mean, I'm very on top of the data. And so in my class, we really talk about all of, not just the process of it, but also uh, what is going on in the market, which has been incredibly important, of course, in the last two months. And then each of the other fab five will uh, talk about their portion. They talk about down payment assistance programs and lending and, you know, escrow title and all of those things. So, the thing that was awesome about that class is that when you have people in person, you set the expectation right at the beginning. We're going to be setting one-to-one -one appointments at the end of this class. Like with, and when we were meeting in person with the lender first and then with me. So we're going to meet on Tuesday at two o'clock and from two to two 30, you're going to meet with Natalie. You have already given her all of her, all of your, your documentation by then. She's going to get your pre-approval done in that half an hour. And then from two 30 to four, you're mine. And that's the buyer's consult and the buyer's uh, broker agreement and all, you know, wants and needs and all of that stuff. Right. So we just set that expectation right at the beginning of the class. And then when, as they were leaving the class, we would literally just have our calendars out everybody and just set them. Our, um, our retention for so, people that were coming in was 95%. We had 95% of the people in our classes set appointments. Now they're not all ready to go right now. Some of them are six months out or a year out. I actually have someone under contract that took my class seven months ago. It happened, you know, like we don't know where they are. They don't know where they are, but um, it, was, it, it was outstanding. And the way that we're doing that now is we're still doing a once a month class and it's via Zoom and we have uh, my lender's assistant is messaging people like in that private chat, like that little chat box on Zoom that just says, hey, Natalie um, has got a phone appointment now since we can't all meet together. Natalie has a phone appointment on Friday at two. How does that work? And then Natalie sends them over to me. And, you know, I would say the... Um, the retention, you know, if you get 40 people on a call, you're not going to have, you know, 38 people who are going to set appointments because it's different when you're not in person, but it's, but you also have the op a lot more opportunity because you can have a hundred people in, in that class instead of like 25. So um, how did you transition that? Because uh, you go from a, Hey, come meet me to this is our zoom meeting and then maintain the conversion. How did you transition that process? Tons of follow-up. Right, so when they are when they are um, registering through Zoom, um, I there's places in Zoom where you can put like not just their your email but also your phone and your address and all that. So they that's a requirement before they even register. Right, all of that registration stuff has to be in there. Um, and so we make sure that before the class that we have a touch, they go as soon as we we see them register, they go right into command. They're on a smart plan. They take the class. We again we set that expectation right in the beginning that we are going to be setting up appointments. And then Natalie's assistant, of course, is setting those appointments. Um, and for anybody that didn't, I'm just calling them. We're calling, we're texting, we're emailing um, just to follow up to see if they have questions. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think um, part of it too is that the people that are joining the class are generally people that have been recommended by other people that have taken the class. So they're pretty dialed in already. Um, and I'm doing a ton of, I do a paid ad for all of my classes through social media, through Facebook. Um, there's an event page and that also gets shared, not just on my business page, but also in all of those referral groups and networking groups and all of that. 
And I try to use key words that are going to attract people so that they're not these sort of vague terms, but key words that are going to attract people that I'm covering things that are going to be important to them that people have questions about. What have you found to be those key words? Um, you know, is now a good, are house prices dropping? They're not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it, um, are we going into a 2008 recession? No. You know, like these, or are we, um, you know, just the, you know, are there, are there down payment assistant options still available? You know, these are first time home buyers for the most part, by and large, right? So I'm thinking about what are the things that they're concerned about? Closing costs, down payments, you know, what's going on with the lending rates? I mean, I don't cover that stuff. Obviously the lender is gonna cover more of the lending part of it, but those are sort of those key topics that people wanna know. Um, you know, um, in Oregon, if you break your lease, it's a year, it's a month and a half rather of, of uh, rent, right? In order to break a lease. So that's always a question. So it's those sort of key things that everybody always asks about. That's usually what I, what I put in my marketing to draw people into those classes. So you lead it with things that are gonna cause curiosity. Yes. And then I do a newsletter as well every two weeks where I'm promoting my classes um, in between those classes. So if I do the class, like my next class is coming up on the 23rd, two weeks from then, so again, every month, but just in between my classes, I, I do a state of the market class. It's much shorter. It's about 40 minutes and it's just me and a lender. And we're just talking about, again, the market, the actives, the the pendings, the list of sales price ratios, you know, just sort of the data part of it. What's been cool about that is those are not buyer's classes. That's just really open for anybody. But I have had, um, uh, from my last state of the market class, two of those people then two weeks later took the home buyer's class and they're both under contract right now. Even though it's, so it's really just, you know, it's not meant to be a buyer's class, but I think the people, again, that are attracted to state of the market are, a lot of them are gonna convert into, their, into the big class. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you, you've got the key phrases, you push that on Facebook, you've got all of your business partners and affiliates that also push the same message out. So yeah. it's getting out to a huge wide net of people. And then once they do say, okay, I'm going to join, or they come in and they, and they register, let's say the class is a week down the road. Yes. What does the follow-up look like to make sure that they get onto that Zoom call? So they're in a smart plan. And so um, in, I use command yes for everything. I do, um, and the there is a there is an email that goes out when, of course, when they register, and then three days before the class, there's another email again with the Zoom link, um, and then there is a text the day before, just reminding them about the class. And if they still can't remember, then they, we also do an email and a text the morning of the class as well. Um, you know, like last time we had a hundred people register. So here's the thing too. Like, I don't want you to think that this is all like rainbows and butterflies, right? Like it's, it's a lot of work, but um, the thing is, is that like you can get, even if you have a hundred people registered for the class, right? This is just, this is just numbers. You have a hundred people registered for the class. It's um, two hours, Cindy, by the way, it's 11 to one. Um, you have a hundred people registered, 40 people show up. Okay. Now of those 40 people, how many are people going to be, are you going to be able to retain and, and for appointments? So let's just say half. Okay. Let's just say half because it's, it's not as high as it is in person. So let's say half. All right. So you have 20 people in now of those 20 people, 10 people are really not ready to go right now. They got financial stuff. They got to work on their credit, whatever it is. And so maybe you have 10 left. I mean, 10 active buyers. Yeah, I'll take that. For my last class, we had seven. Right. And the fact is, is, you know how much this cost me? Uh, 200 bucks, because that's how much it costs for me to run a social media ad. So, and that's about it. I do give a home warranty to everybody that takes the class who successfully closes business with me and my business and, and our lender. The lender gives them a $500 credit. So let's go crazy, right? And we're say the policy is 375 and then the $200 for the Facebook class, right? I mean, you know, that pays for itself over and over and over and over again. So it's sort of a no brainer. And even it, though there is a lot of follow-up, like, isn't that worth it for, I have never, ever had less than four people get into contract in that first 30 days from a class. Never had less than that. That's what, I mean, in my market, I don't know what it is in Colorado, but average prices in Beaverton around 400,000 ish, give or take. I mean, whatever. Okay. So, um, right. I mean, it, it varies, but let's just say, 
right? That's 10 grand. That's $40,000 in commission in GCI. Is that worth 200 bucks and a little bit of like, a little bit of follow-up? Pretty sure it is. So okay. that right now, that is by far my number one leg of lead generation. The, the referrals and the networking are, are, are flowing into that. In other words, they're all sort of connected. I've never called a FISBO. I've never door knocked for anything other than open houses. I've never called an expired. I don't cold call. My business is completely relationship driven. Like back in the day, I would have like client events, you know, and do all that good stuff too. But right now it's just like everybody else, right? I'm just, I'm reaching out to people doing care calls as far as in my own database. And I'm just attracting new business um, because I have been consistent in marketing this class for the last 13 months. And it's hard because there's a million Zoom calls right now, right? We're on one. Um, there's Zoom. There's like, there's just so much chatter um, on the internet. Everybody's on the internet, which is great, but there's also so much going on. So you really have to dig in and um, connect with people like in a real way. So when you say 200 bucks for your, your Facebook ads, are you doing that through Lead Accelerator? Or are you doing that through a different resource? So, um, I mean, before command was a thing, I was just doing it through Facebook, but now it's through command ads. And what's awesome about that, of course, is that you get the leads. Here's the other piece that I wanted to mention too. Even if you have a hundred people that, that, that register and you get 40 people that actually come into the class, right? The others are DNA, right? Did not attend. Uh, you get a hundred leads in your database every time you do a class. Or again, say it's a slower class and you get 60. It's still 60 leads. Now, again, not all of them are going to convert right now, but like, where else can you get 60 leads? Like, talk about a bold 100, right? I mean, like, where else can you get like, like warm leads like that? It's Those really are all people that raised their hand and said, I'm interested, might not be able to make it to your class. Let's go. Yes. They're, now they're in my drip campaigns or in my newsletters. They're getting, they're getting invites to all of my classes that I'm doing. I'm getting my name out there. I mean, I just got an, an email last night from someone who um, took a class about a year ago. She wasn't really ready. And I got an email from her last night. And she's like, hey, Aubrey, um, and this has been happening, right, with quarantine stuff, is that parents now are starting to move in with their kids. They want to be closer to their kids. Not my parents, that's not a good idea, but like other people's parents, right? They wanna like combine households. So I was like, okay, cool, Fiona, that's awesome. Um, tell me about the areas that you're looking in and, and all that sort of stuff. And I said, so what's your price range? She's like, yeah, it's about a million dollars. And I was like, I'm gonna set you up right now, right? I mean, and this is just because some of these people are not ready, but so what? She's been in my drip campaign for a year. Like, what does that cost me? Nothing, zero. My, you should see my budget, Gary would be so proud. My budget, like other than my marketing for Facebook, I mean, I have my vendors pay for almost everything else. And I don't really, I don't pay for Zillow leads. Like I don't pay for any leads. I mean, other than like, you know, through, through command and Facebook, but that, that's just the normal part of my, of my social media marketing. So Amy asked, what does a day in your life look like? How do you, how do you put it all together? How do you balance it? I mean, the conversation we had a year ago in bold was, I want to be a good mom. I want to be a great mom and I want to be a great agent. So it's now it's different than it was when I was, I always go to the, I go to the office every day, five days a week. I mean, not now, but I was, um, that was really necessity for me because I, I, I feel like I will do anything to avoid lead generation at home, even if it means laundry, which I hate, but I will still do laundry before I do lead generation. So I have to go to the office where there is no laundry to be had. And um, so I would go take my kids to school, go to the gym. That was my non-negotiable and then go to work. And then when the kids were done at 3.30, I am done for the day. And then I take my kids to their various stuff. And then we have dinner as a family. And then in the evening, I'm working again on um, follow up on my lead, on my, whatever my business was for the day. Now here, like this is just a, right? I mean, with quarantine. So, um, but I do try to keep a schedule that's very similar. It's just now I'm in my office. You can see my television over there where my door is locked so that my children cannot come in. But um, what I was doing, which was a terrible, was that I was working from like 
eight o'clock in the morning to like eight o'clock at night while we've been under quarantine. Like I can't stop working and I'm not always working. I'm just sort of like puttering around and I, I don't know what the heck I was doing. So I needed to get much more intentional and so I went back, um, and I, again, this was really with the help of my MAPS coach, who is awesome because she does not, she calls me in all my BS constantly, which is fab, really fantastic. And she said, listen, like, I was like, I'm not really spending any time with my kids. I want to go out and like take walks because, you know, it's, it's, people don't think it actually has sun in Oregon, but actually it's, it's sunny a lot of the year. Not when you were there, Jake, but most of the time. Um, every now and then it was good. Every now and then. It's beautiful right now. So from 12 to 2. Um, aside from today, um, from 12 to two, I take off that time with my kids every day during quarantine. So we are, I'm making them lunch. We're going to go out for a walk and all of that. So I start my day at eight. I do my stuff until, um, uh, until 12. And then with bold, I've had to shift things a little bit and that's okay. It doesn't matter that it's 12 to two. It just has to be a two hour chunk in the middle of the day. So I just, I have to shift that a little bit. Um, and then, um, we do lunch and we, we, do whatever, not schoolwork either. I'm not working, they're not doing schoolwork. They go back to their schoolwork at around two. I go back to work at two, I'm done at five, I do dinner, and then again, we go outside um, and do stuff after dinner. So the biggest difference between now and when I was in the office is that that two hour chunk was something I never had with them because it was in the middle of the day. So I'm not, the amount of hours that I'm working isn't different now than what it was when I was in the office. I just shifted that um, so that it works better for the schedule and where we are right now. How did you end your day at 3.30 to be home? I'm sure there's folks on this, on this call that are thought, oh, well, okay, that sounds great. It sounds heavenly and how? Because I, I have it in my schedule so that I drop the kids off at eight. I go to the gym from 8.30 to 9.30. From 9.30 until 3.30, I mean, I'm bringing my lunch to work. I'm not, I have six hours of work time, right? So I have two hours of lead generation. I've got two hours of following up on and doing all my stuff. Um, and then, you know, two hours of like, I don't know, I'm ALC culture chair too. So there's always people like, you know, knocking on the door. So, but I mean, you've got to figure, you know, Jason Abrams talked about this a lot too, like, People think that there's like no time in the day. There's tons of time in the day. We just don't utilize it well. We have lots of time in the day. So I have six solid hours in the office and then I'm done. At 3.30, I go take my kids to their various Girl Scouts or I don't even know what anymore. Um, and then, but even those are done. Like it doesn't mean that I don't do anything in the evening. My day isn't necessarily done at 3.30. I just leave at 3.30. And then, you know, like while my, you know, like my daughter's at gymnastics or whatever, like I'm, I'm engaged wherever I am. I'm engaged with that. If I'm with my children, I am with them. Like I am not dealing with my phone and all that sort of stuff. Like that, that, that doesn't work for me. But when I'm at work, I'm also really at work. So if I leave at 3.30 and then we've got whatever their cockamamie after school thing is, and then I've got dinner. And then after dinner, I'm gonna like, of course, get back to all of those people. But there's nobody that can't wait a few hours um, for me to get back to them. And, and of course, you know, I have to write offers. I write offers at night generally, right? I mean, so I'm not, my day isn't done at 3.30. I'm just taking off at 3.30. So if you figure I'm done at 3.30, that's six hours. And then say I get back on at around seven, seven to nine or so, because my kids are winding down or whatever, that's an eight hour day. And you're just time blocked. I'm just time blocked. I'm not doing any less hours than, than anybody else. And of course, you know, on weekends, that's a whole other can of tomatoes. Right, because yeah, like because there's stuff, but I'm telling you, having a showing assistant, once you get a transaction coordinator, that's your first hire, admin is first hire. But getting a a, a showing assistant, if you're buyer heavy, will change your life because that's where my weekends got blown, were just showings and driving all over town. And I drag my kids with me because it was like the only way that I would get to see my kids on the weekend was driving from house to house and having them hang out with me in the car. Yeah, that's not, it's not, <laughs> I don't recommend it. Get a showing assistant. When you, so, when you have enough business to support it, do that. So I mean, that becomes the question, right? You've got this great big, you've got this business that's growing. You get a showing assistant to create the freedom to be able to do those things or, or to do more lead gen or whatever it is you choose to focus on. And yet, what are you... But I made a great point. You're, you run a highly profitable business. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
even though you're full, you, you've got all this leverage in place, the way you set it up and the way you structured it, what's your profit margin? What percentage? Well, I mean, we, so I'm giving Andrew gets 15%. That's my showing assistant, right? Um, every transaction, Emily, who is my TC, gets $550 per transaction. And I know that that seems a little high to some of you, but I, I don't care because she, she, does, she does client care along with that. The woman, like, I would be lost without her. I'm completely loyal and devoted to her. So I don't even care if it's less expensive someplace else because she's worth it. Um, my listing coordinator is 250. So all of my listings gets 250. And then once we get under contract, of course, Emily takes over on the TC side, on the TC side right? Um, my um, client gifts are one of those things that I really um, got a lot better about as far as like just not spending left and right. I'm very sort of careful about, about that as well. Um, my husband is a photographer and a web developer, marry one or um, get friends with one. Um, so all of my, um, uh, the, what do they call that? The dollhouse um, Matterport. He does my Matterport. He does my photos. He does my individualized website. So I, I don't, I pay him in grief, I guess, but he doesn't get paid for anything. Um, and honestly, like other than my classes for Facebook, that's it. I mean, I have, other than when I pay Andrew to do showings, and that's not even 100% of the time, I sometimes do showings for like close friends or whatever it is. So I still take them from time to time. But I mean, if, if you've got 15% for Andrew, say it's again, $10,000 commission, I capped, I always, you know, I don't say always, but I cap usually within around six weeks of when I first, you know, get back into my new year. So say it's $10,000, say 1,500 of that goes to Andrew, right? So now you're at 85. You've got 550 that goes to Emily. Um, so now you're at 7950, right? That's it. That's it. I mean, I have my, my client gifts are about 100 bucks. Um, so you're 70, 75 percent profit. Uh -huh. and, and you're at home at 3:30 uh -huh. with your kids. Yeah, my, and on the weekends last year was 3:50. And on the weekends. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because that 15% will be a huge time saver for you. And um, one of the things that my MAPS coach told me about was like, and this was before the quarantine stuff was like, you know, just look at your personal finances and look at your business finances and just cut out the fat. There's so much stuff that everybody, not just me, but everybody can just cut out that you don't need. And one of the things that I realized that was a huge blessing, it didn't feel like it at the time was I was paying my assistant $2,500 a month for that. And what I realized is that doing a virtual assistant who was doing things at a much higher level than what my assistant could ever do um, for $500 a month was totally worth it. So you gotta put that into my budget as well, right? Because that's 120 or $125 a week. Mm -hmm. But again, the amount of business that I can do and I do because of my virtual assistant and because of my TC, it allows me to go from 46 transactions to 70. It almost doubled my business. Well, not double, but math, right? 75% more of my business this year than last year. So is that worth it to get back my time? And it's not just time. It's not like, oh, well, now I've got to, you know, like that, that's the balance, right? In order to get my, back my time, then I'm going to have to give up some salary. I almost doubled my salary. I mean, so yeah, I got back time and I have more GCI. That's a win-win yep. or no deal. So before I shift, because there's a great question in the chat we'll hit on here in a second. There's like and, 18 that I haven't even looked up. And it's okay. I've got you covered. Thank you. This is, I, I was just taking some notes and kind of looking at it. I, I'm, I go in back into the, okay, what's the system? What's the model process, right? Because you've given us a really succinct model and system that anybody could follow if you want, if they wanted to follow your footsteps. And it was a conversation around, okay, go be the, 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 the conversation starter, go be the, the connector in the community. The resource. Be that through a BNI group or through other resources, find a place to be, be able to connect people. Number I one. was also, when I first started too, I should mention too, one of the first things I did is I um, was PTO president at my kid's school. I would not recommend it. It's a terrible job, but do something that, and Jason Abrams talked about this a lot too. This really hit home with me. Do things with people, do things that you like to do with people that you like, 
right? And so that's where I'm really, I think, good is that I have, I have things that I love to do that have nothing to do with real estate. And you just connect with those people who also love those things. And then they know, like, and trust you. And so like, well, who the heck else are they going to ask about, about anything real estate? I go to one of my kids' birthday parties, you know, for a friend. And again, not recently, but when I did. And yes, I'm going there because I want to like hang out with my mom friends and stuff. But do you think that I don't know what the market overview is of the neighborhood where I'm going? I mean, I, because everybody asks about that. If, I mean, otherwise, like why would HGTV be so popular? Everybody cares about like this stuff, right? Everybody's interested. So it doesn't mean that I'm going in there with the intention of like selling real estate. It means that like I'm going in there with the intention of having a good time and connecting in a real way with people that I already like. And I also know that data before I step in the door because I'm not an idiot. A hundred percent. So become the connector and then take that to social. Yep. So you can build out that group even bigger. And then as you create the events, now you've got a large network Correct. of people and a huge net that you get to, to funnel them in. Into. To funnel them in. Yeah. yeah. So it's not just your thousand people on Facebook. It's your thousand plus 500 other people's thousands. Yep. And that creates and Also, that. and I have to tell you, I am not someone who's particularly awesome with computers and technology. I'm not like, so when I, I say this in a, in a, not like, oh, I'm just being self-deprecating. I'm, I'm totally serious about this. If I can do this, anybody can do this because it is not my forte. I am 44 years old. Like I didn't grow up with computers. I don't care. And I don't even really like them that much. But the fact is, is that this is something that works because social media is something that most people do and you have to meet people where they are. So it may not be social media. Maybe it's really a phone call or a text or however it is that they prefer to be commun to be communicated with. And that's what Bold was really, when we when you did Bold 2.0, that's when we really start to see that change of like, okay, it's not always gonna be phone calls. Not everybody can be reached via phone. Let's figure out other avenues. So for me, it is mostly Facebook. It is mostly social media to connect, but it depends on, on, on where people wanna meet. So Amy asks, and I love this question, what was it at Mega Camp that made you say, okay, I'm going to make the switch to KW? Oh my gosh. What is it that keeps you at KW? I mean, I know it's hokey, but it's culture for me. And I know that Gary would be like, no, it's the technology. And I'm like, um, no, I mean, it's only in that I hate technology. I mean, like I get it. It's a technology company and I'm very grateful for it because the, the fact is, is that someone like me, had we not had the technology in place, I would be floundering right now just like a lot of my colleagues in the industry because we didn't have that stuff in place. But for me, it was the fact that people share information freely. Um, they're coming from this place of contribution that the priority for me at Keller really is your family and your faith before business. And um, I mean, I'm culture chair now for ALC. You know, I believe it, I live it. Um, these people, from day one, when I was at Mega Camp, this the group, it was mostly ALC, took care of me. And I know I'd never even been to Austin before. I'd never even been to Texas. It was very overwhelming. Um, but I really felt like it wasn't a sales pitch. I really felt like it was people really genuinely caring and, and reaching out to help. Um, that in addition to just you know, that, that section where Gary does like the state of the company and he's talking about just like all of like the data and the market trends and all of that. And I'm, I'm like sold. I mean, between the fact that just everybody was so coming from this place of contribution plus that piece of it, holy wow. And I still feel this way. I go to every mega camp. I go to every family reunion. Um, I will go see anybody that comes in. I take every time I take bowls. Like I, I'm a, I'm a lifer. At Keller Williams, like there's no, I would never go anywhere else, ever. And what makes you say that? What makes you say that you would never go anywhere else? Because the value that I get from the company and just the, the collaboration, um, I just, I love my people. It doesn't feel like, an, like it's an adversarial, it could be an adversarial market, right? Because it's real estate agents, you know, technically, but um, they have given me enormous education 
and opportunities to not only take classes, but also teach classes, right? So I'm teaching in different market centers. Um, Jake knows that um, I was invited to teach in Scotland over the summer, which of course is gonna be postponed, but um, I was a high school teacher. So for me, that opportunity to not just grow my real estate business, but also grow the other part of what I really love, which is the educational piece, um, you never stop learning there. And the opportunity at Keller Williams is it's limitless. It's literally limitless. So when I said to my TL, like, yes, I want to grow my business. And I also really, I lived abroad and I really want that opportunity for my family to take them abroad as well. And so I'd really like to talk to other market centers. Her first reaction was not, you should just work on being master faculty at our market center, which I am. She said, let me put you in touch with train the presenter. Let's get you to where you're going and what you want to do. That is what I want from leadership is for them to say, not like, well, how is that going to affect my market center? Like, how's your team? You know, but the priority was how can we get you where you want to go without limit? And that to me is priceless. It is. So last quick question about your business. Since your showing assistant is not necessarily part of your team, how do you ensure that they represent you and are also available when you need them to show? So um, I trained him for one thing is that for the first part of the question is how do we make sure that we're, that they're representing me well. Um, when I meet with a client and we're going through the buyer's consult, I, whether it's through Zoom or when it was in person, I introduce Andrew right at the onset and I explain how this process works. Listen, it's much more important that you see the house than you see the house with me. Because frankly, Andrew's better at showing houses and his availability is better. Um, he doesn't have young kids at home. Um, and then with Andrew, we have a kind of a checklist and a sheet. Um, and look, it wasn't, you know, in the very beginning, you know, it was, it was a learning curve for sure. But we have a feedback sheet now that I get from him every time that we go see a house. And I'm still doing all the negotiations and talking to the, you know, talking to the agents and all that sort of stuff. But he's setting up the appointments and he's showing. Um, look, and the thing is, Andrew will likely outgrow me. And I hope that he does because like he's a good agent. And then um, when I'm allowed to get my PB, which is actually this summer, I may have someone who was on my team to be a, um, you know, to be a showing assistant. But my intention, to be honest, is not to have a big team. I like this setup pretty well. Like there's nothing wrong with being a solo agent. Um, and I understand the Keller Williams model with teams, and I think it works beautifully. For me, I don't think that I can be someone who provides a lot of value at this point because I'm still really trying to figure things out as far as my systems. And I don't want to like throw someone into chaos before I'm really ready. So for right now, this works out really well. And when Andrew outgrows me, then I will find another um, agent who is looking to grow their business or their own business as well but would like to have something more on a consistent basis um, and get you know thousand fifteen hundred two thousand dollars you know if i'm doing i usually do between five and you know eight transactions a month right so if they can get six of those you know that's six seven thousand dollars just from being a showing assistant it doesn't suck I mean, I don't think it does. I think it's a pretty good deal for them to be showing and they don't have to do any of the negotiations or anything, but it's time. What I'm, what they're giving me is time. <clears throat> so as we wrap it up today, give us your ahas. What are you taking away from, from Aubrey and, and her story and what she shared with us? I'm going to read the notes while you guys are talking. <laughs> I didn't read Go any. For it. Thank you. You guys should be able to unmute yourself in the bottom corner. Otherwise you can type them and we'll read them aloud. So I'll say that my aha was, it, it just, it's something I know and yet it occurred to me because I love teaching as well and I love social media and I love how you are focusing so much of who you are to developing that piece of your business and getting leads from that piece of business and just the social things that you're doing. It's, it's motivating to me to get get an actual plan together. So thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you. Who else? 
I'll jump in real quick. Um, this was actually <clears throat> fantastic. I had requested this uh, from Jake about a week or two ago. And so it's awesome to, I'm a single agent and it's just, it's, it's phenomenal what you're doing, Aubrey. And, and <clears throat> the fact that you have, you know, time is the new money in, in, in many ways. And you have created an incredible system to give you the time to be with your family and still have a huge business. I mean, that's, you know, I'm like you, I have no desire for a team at this point. I just, you know, and, and, and it's great and stuff, but it's just, there's ways to do this on your terms where you get to decide your ceiling, you know, like how far you want to go and have the showing agents and, and, and the events. I mean, I've, I've got like a whole page of notes here, but it's really, it's, it's just, I, I can't thank you enough for just you, how authentic you are. And, um, and it's uh, been really, really helpful. So thank I'm you. So, I'm so glad. And I think that ceiling piece is so important because um, I think the more you leverage out, the more you realize there is no ceiling. It's just, you can always, it's, it's just figuring out what your 20% is and that might change over time, right? You can just leverage out that other 80% as you grow your business. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, I, there is nothing holding me back as a solo agent and there's nothing holding you back either by not having a team. It, it doesn't mean that you don't have people that help you, but the structure of like a Keller Williams team is not, you don't have to have that. 100%. And, and by the way, thank you, Bud, for requesting it because obviously we had the connections, we had the opportunity, and thanks for being here, Aubrey, to, to pour into everybody. Um, Adrian says, thank you. Lorna says that she needs to do Zoom buyer seminars. Yes, yes, and yes. And we can talk more about that. And, um, they love how real you are and how transparent you were. I did too. Um, that's what you always, always impressed me was through the course of Bold and the conversations that we've had, you were willing to get vulnerable quick, which allowed us to have real conversations and really grow together and grow that business. So thank you for all you do, Aubrey. Appreciate it. If you like to reach out, is it okay if they reach out to you? Is there a specific way you prefer it? I, um, I, I put my email address in there. And then also, I'm just going to put in my, um, my Facebook page, which is my business page. Um, and, of course, you can find me on Facebook as well. Because what the heck else are we doing right now? Um, and feel free to join. Um, I do... And I have been doing these Zoom classes for people um, on anything that is of interest to them for other agents. So if there's any specific thing that you feel like you wanna do a Zoom call on, then just let me know and I'm happy to share and would love to get some of the things that you guys are doing at a high level that works well for you too. Yeah, if you'd like to bring it into the, the team meetings or any of that, just let the team leaders know and we can definitely put this something like that together. Thanks again, Aubrey, for your time. Thanks for everything you do and for giving to us. So awesome. Thank you for asking. Um, oh, uh, Cindy asked the next, uh, the buyer seminar is on the next one's on the 23rd. So um, that's on my Facebook page. So yeah, you are always, on your calendar. well, that was Siri. Um, I, I, you're always welcome. Agents are always welcome to sit in on the classes. That's totally fine. Awesome. Thanks so much. You guys have a great day. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Aubrey. Appreciate you. Thanks so much, Aubrey.